Chair, as have been introduced, my name is Faithful Mensah Yakwa, and I'm presenting this paper. It's actually a work in progress paper on behalf of my two other colleagues, Robert Bakonse and then Isaac Oseyakuto. And this is actually a motivation that we had from some things we went with it uh, two years ago, where we tried to look at or evaluate the cash transfer program that the government of Ghana initiated. Uh, this paper, Poverty and Happiness, an examination of the factors influencing happiness among the extreme poor in Ghana. Now, that program essentially looked at people who, according to the Ghana uh, Living Standard Survey, are considered poor. And so the target population for the intervention were people who are considered at the extreme 20% bottom of the poverty line. And so, more or less, the poor of the poor. And, and so that is, by way of outline, I want to give some brief background and then the approach we are adopting and some basic results that we have found so far. You know, how many of us here don't want to be happy in life, you know? I guess we all try to aspire at different points to, to get some level of happiness. Uh, and the desire for happiness, according to the literature and other scholars, it's an inner fulfillment, and it comes as a result of several factors. So what, for example, might be happiness for me uh, is completely different from what might be happiness for the other person. And again, it is not the concept of happiness, you know, it's not just one indicator that I have achieved A, and so I am happy in life. It is quite complex. And so it's become a subject of interest to a lot of scholars in recent times, not just psychologists which we, who, were, you know, the, who were looking at happiness in the past, but economists and other scholars are interested in that. Now, they argue that the search for happiness is the ultimate goal of human you know, action. And so whatever we are doing, for example, I want to you know, publish a paper, or you want to get a, a particular degree, you want to obtain some asset, you know, you get that and you think, ah, yes, I made it. But after getting that, you realize that, yeah, it just lasts for a while and you want to get something else, you know. It's, however, a well-documented fact that one single factor, as I said, does not necessarily, you know, define happiness of an individual. And so if we are looking at this group of people who we consider poor and so we want to more or less, the idea is to smoothen their consumption level. Is that going to help them, you know, become happy? Or it is just enough to say that, okay, we've helped you, and so we think we've done our best. So if you critically review the literature across all spectrum of uh, our discipline, you see that it is a combination of demographic factors, a combination of psychological, physiological, uh, you know, and other behavioral characteristics that interplay to more or less explain someone's level of happiness. By way of approach, as I indicated from the start, the sample for this particular paper is drawn from, you know, household study that we did and it looked at the bottom 20% of the extreme poor population, according to the DLSS 5, and DLSS is Ghana Living Standard Survey. And we had 50, a little over 1,500 households who, who were actually recruited to take part in this particular piece of work, looking at both beneficiaries of the cash transfer program and non-beneficiaries alike. And so the whole idea is, okay, so for those who are considered poor in the same category, and some group of them are receiving some benefit, does that make them happier relative to their counterparts who are not receiving any form of support? So each household head, of course, who or the most knowledgeable person or most influential person within the decision-making process in the household was interviewed. And of course, from the review of literature, you see that 
other people would use, or especially psychologists, several questions to form an index to be able to say, okay, this person is happy or not. But the approach here is that given all the ups and downs, given all the you know, irregularities among several other factors, if you are to assess your own life to say whether or not you are happy or not, what is your position? And so then they are given the opportunity to answer a yes, they are happy in life, or they are not. And that becomes our depending variable. And, and when we introduce, of course, different covariates that uh, we suspect strongly could influence their level of happiness, and we, we run the model. Let me just quickly run you through some results. The first is the marital status of the people who responded to our questions. And this, for example, is very important to us, given the kind of people who are beneficiaries of the cash transfer. Usually you find that these are people who are very old, aged people, orphans and vulnerable children, and so there's always somebody who is a caretaker. And so we were very interested in this variable, trying to understand the marital status of the people. And here you find that you find that about the um, majority of them, of course, about 41% are married. But for me, the interesting part is the group who are widowed. And you will see quite soon why. Because most of the people, as I go through, you will see, if you see the widowed group of people, the divorced, never married, these are people, if you begin to consider their ages, you would understand better. So usually it's a grandmother or grandfather of an orphan or somebody, or somebody who has no other person and so has decided to volunteer his or her time to take care of somebody who considered to be needy in society. For the age category, the average age across gender we see to be about 60 years. So it gives you an idea the kind of people who really are taking care of, or who are the, the, the caregivers of these cash transfer programs. But of course, with female being in uh, slightly older than the male counterparts. Now, religion is a very, of course, tricky variable, but we also were interested in understanding whether or not this variable may play a role in trying to see or explain the extent of you know, happiness among beneficiary households. And we see, of course, this just mimicking the general population, uh, the religion, religious affiliation of the general population. Uh, Christians in the, in, in, in the dominant, and then followed by Muslim and traditional religion. The type of housing units that they live in were also of interest to us. Whether or not if you know, a beneficiary or a household benefiting from the transfer program lives in their own, more or less, flat, or they live in a compound house, they all have implications in defining what would make them happy. And we see that, of course, for most of the respondents, about half the respondents, they live in a compound house, and the compound house is a, is a, a, a central ground that there are several other household units that live in there. And so they, they, they live in compound houses that they have access to more than one room within that unit or that housing structure. Now, we find, of course, some use other variables for example, average number of rooms available to these people, I just mentioned compound house, so within that unit, housing structure, you find that they have at least or about three rooms that are available to them. Then also of interest, the, all of them are interest, but of interest to us, but also of interest I want to highlight is the proportion of households raising livestock. Of course, some have argued that if you know, people are raising livestock and they have other income generating activities, it may influence, of course, 
consumption patterns and also you know has implication for nutrition and other things and so possibly might influence the level of happiness uh, about 56 percent of them indicated that they raise one livestock or the other and this could be maybe a, a fowl or goat or whatever at least they raise a livestock proportion owing money or goods to other people and so these are people who you know are poor in the first place and so we want to understand whether or not that knowing that you don't have money, you, 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 you are needy, but you are also indebted to other people, does that you know, influence your happiness level? And about 25% or about 26% indicate that yes, they either owe money or some goods to other individuals within the community. Uh, to proportion of households receiving institutional transfers. And my main interest, a variable of interest is this variable, proportion of households who actually receive uh, institutional transfers. And I indicated earlier that we looked at <coughs> persons or households who are receiving the transfer and those who are not receiving the transfer. And a little, about 39% of our respondents who are used in this analysis indicate that yes, they receive the cash transfer program. What does the result say? We find quite interesting that for households that actually live in a compound house that has other households living within that compound house, their chances of being happy is positive. And that is also significant, statistically. Then we find also that for households who are indebted, whether in cash or in goods, to other people, it actually declines or reduces their probability of being happy. Of course, if you look at this, the fact that I owe you, and I'm not too sure where I'm going to get the money from, and you may come at, at me at any point in time to demand your money. It brings about some level of uh, social pressure where it becomes quite difficult for you to effectively participate, effectively take part in uh, decision making, uh, because you are not too sure when your, your, the next person is coming to uh, ask you for their money or goods. Now. However, just as it is for indebtedness to the household, if other people owe monies to the household, or monies that are supposed to come to the household, though they don't have it, that influences or it increases, has the tendency or the probability of you know, making them happy. So I know that I don't have money today, but I know somebody owes me. That gives me some hope and gives me some joy that all is not, all hope is not lost. And for households who are fortunate and operated an agricultural plot, at least in the last 12 months, they also has a very high probability of being happy. Another interesting variable, which actually uh, I meets our a priori expectation, is those who operate non-farm businesses or non farm enterprises, where we try to look at whether or not these households, uh, apart from the agricultural activities they may be engaged in, do they have any form of activity that brings money to the household, that makes them see or exchange, you know, a basic enterprise, whether repairing, whether selling ice water or so ever. And positively, does for a household that does any of these, it enhances the probability that they are a happy household. Now my interest variable, which is the institutional transfer. Trying to look at, for those who actually are receiving institutional transfers, of course, given the fact that you receive transfers and your other colleagues, the same level with you don't receive, we expect that you should be happier. Unfortunately, they have a negative 
assigned to their coefficient. Basically, it's saying that for those who have been, you know, who had been enrolled on the cash transfer program, contrary to what we saw that we had this morning in a Brazilian experience, they were less happy. And so again, it became quite of an interest to us. And the, the explanation to that is society in itself has a way of taking care of the poor. Before the cash transfer program came, in a way that people were surviving. Society had measures in which everybody knows that Mrs. A or Mr. B is poor and there was a way of taking care of them. But once your name comes up that you are going to receive this from government or you are now a recipient of some intervention, it naturally cuts off some people who would have either to come to your aid. Otherwise, you will be better off than them anyway. And so, unfortunately, the cash transfer program, though it started very well, has not really received consistency in terms of disbursement. And so the people have been enlisted and they receive the money for a few months and they are not too sure when the next tranche of transfers were coming. And so over time, instead of getting help from neighbors and society, that is not coming. Government support is also not coming. And so that potentially explains what makes them unhappy, although they have been enlisted to receive cash transfers from the government. All we are saying with this piece of work is that households receiving institutional transfers have a higher likelihood of being unhappy. And the explanation is what I just gave you. Operating an agricultural plot and a non-farm activity we found to be, you know, to have a positive influence on extreme poor happiness. And so are these potentially variables and things that we can, or policymakers can begin to look at as we design new programs. So that it's not just cash transfer, but can we look at strengthening the things that make them happy as part of the broader design framework? And, you know, instead of identifying people or allowing people to be in isolation, of course, living in a compound house, once I know that I can observe and know that the whole day you have not taken any meal, if I'm cooking, definitely I may pass on something little to you which might solve some problem in the interim. Whereas if you were just on your own somewhere, you know, you are hungry and you might just be hungry yourself and no one might know about it. And so it's a thing that we are beginning to question and asking whether are there ways that we can begin to look at some of these things in designing our policies to achieve greater effect efficiency. Happiness declines with households who are indebted. I already mentioned that. And a variable we find quite interesting, not very strong, but at least if we stretch our statistical analysis to about 10% level of significance, we find this to be an influencing factor as household headed how, uh, households that have, you know, or Muslim headed households, you know, they tend to be happier relative to the other religions. Again, for us, is there something unique about the way they do things that potentially we can give some attention and understand some more to be able to help improve on the situation. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Hifford, for making it exactly on time. <laughs>